States Naval Institute. Good morning. Well, on behalf of FC International and Naval Institute, welcome you to our third and final day of West 2018. We're having a strong finish, which will start this morning. It's my pleasure to introduce our morning keynote speaker. Secretary James F. Gertz was sworn in 5 December as Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition as the Department of the Navy's Acquisition Executive. He has oversight of an annual budget of $60 billion. He previously served as the Acquisition Executive for the Special Operations Command. At SOCOM, he was recognized for his innovation, leadership, and technological ingenuity. Prior to senior executive service, Secretary Gertz served in uniform as a career Air Force officer. He held engineering and program management leadership positions in numerous weapon systems programs to include intercontinental ballistic missiles, surveillance, tactical fighter aircraft, advanced avionics, stealth cruise missiles, training systems, and manned and unmanned special operations aircraft. Altogether, he has 30 years of total joint acquisition experience, and he served in acquisition leadership positions, including acquisition executive, program executive officer, program manager, graduate of Lehigh, holds a master in electrical engineering from Air Force Institute Technology, Wright-Pat, and a master of national security resourcing from ICAF. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Assistant Secretary of the Navy, James Gertz. Thanks, Pete. Thanks. You guys hear me all right? Awesome. Morning, morning. How you doing? Good. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, it's really, really important that we do these events where we gather everybody in kind of a one spot. Uh, and when I've looked over the program, uh, I'm actually jealous I was not able to be out here for a couple of days because you've had a great set of speakers setting the stage. And then I think the lunch today will kind of close that all out. Pete, Admiral, thanks for, for coming. Uh, We've got a great leadership team up here, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. So San Diego is a, it's a great place to come back to. It reminds me of how nice the weather is in the winter in Tampa, which I'm missing right now. Um, but if I think back 30 years ago, just up the road, I was working on mobile ICBM nuclear missiles. And my job then as Second Lieutenant Gertz was on meteor burst VHF communications and how are we going to communicate in a denied environment? Hey, how do we have nuclear surety, all those kinds of things. Ten years later, I was up the road with a little company called Cubic. I was the data link officer between Joint Stars uh, Air Force and uh, the Army Ground Station module, Desert Storm time. And that was really the time where we saw what ISR, command and control, and a network force sensor to shooter could really do in Desert Storm days. Ten years later, I'm back here in San Diego with the SEALs on the special ops guys, and I think they showed over the last 15 years what a disaggregated but networked synchronized force, how powerful that can be, and the risk if you don't operate that way. And you operate in big formations uh, and have not very good communications. And so I think you know San Diego is really the perfect place uh, to be thinking about uh, the future. You had Secretary Shanahan here, and I, you know, I, Thank goodness we have a framework now we can all deliver on. Uh, and that's really powerful. So we've got a great now national defense strategy. Uh, the challenge for us, whether you're at the deck plate level, whether you're in industry, academia, in a program office, is how do we deliver on that strategy? How do we shake off the barnacles? How do we rig for speed? How do we deliver on that strategy? And that's what I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about. But I want to leave a lot of time for Q&A. And, uh, and make sure that, again, we can continue the dialogue. And, and my main intent is how do we take that commander's intent from Secretary Mattis, uh, take Secretary Spencer's view of the world, which is about urgency, how do we take the CNO's vision of six pillars, bigger, better, uh, talented, networked, agile, and reliable? How do you take the commandant's view of we've got to have a a comm system that will survive in any environment that allows us to operate uh, as a marine expeditionary force. How do we in this room deliver on that? So it's great to put the strategy up there, and that's a necessary first step. 
The challenge for us now is how do we deliver on that? Next slide, please. So I think to do that, I'm going to focus, and we need to focus kind of on four kind of pillars. And I'll say Naval Force, so that's Navy and Marine Corps. All right, our job now, given the, the new strategy, given the strategy of competing, deterring, and winning, how do we enable that? How do we put those tools in the hands of our warfighters so we, we can take advantage of what's always been our biggest competitive advantage, which is people, right? We haven't won wars because of equipment. We've won them because of people. So our challenge is how do we get those tools into the hands of our folks at the speed of relevance, right? At, a, at an affordable price with some agility because we won't be right the first time, right? With a workforce that's ready to keep doing this for the next 20 years. So I'm gonna kind of go through each one of these a little bit and kind of give you the vision. I come from kind of SOCOM school of intent-based leadership. And the whole thing I'm driving within our leadership team is not you will do this and you will do that, it's here's the intent. Secretary Mattis has given us clear intent, Secretary Spencer has given us clear intent, now we've gotta go off and deliver. Next slide. So to me, the first thing is it's all about delivering lethal capacity, right? Delivering capacity that's not lethal is not very valuable. Delivering very small elements of lethality that we can't get across the globe is not very useful. So how do we develop that lethal capacity, right? And really, when I look at combat power, it's, it's a combination of capa or, or capacity, how much stuff do we have, how do we get the most capability on all that stuff for lethality? And then what we sometimes forget, which is as key as the first two, is how, and then how do we make it available? And when you think of uh, you know, IT and the things FC is going after, they're really squarely in zone two, right? They're really at, how, that really enables lethality. But it's not just networking the force. It's how do we use IT, AR, VR, on the support side of things? How do we reduce the cost to build new capacity? A great example right now is we've got DGG Flight 3. Finish that design, the RFP is going out today. We've got two great ship builders that are gonna compete for those ships. And that is gonna bring not only capacity, but increased lethality to the fight. On the C4 world, we're doing, a, a, you know, just at the next phase of comms for the Marine Corps. How do we standardize and use IT the way it's sold? not try and take commercial IT and then convert it somehow and then create unique uh, systems. And then again, we can't forget the availability piece of, part of the things right now. We're really struggling, again, as we add more capacity, how do we make sure we can make that available? How do we use next generation tools, whether it's in construction, repair, inventory control, that allows us then to maximize the number of those assets we have out there in the fleet? Because right now, the fastest way to get more capacity is to use more of what we already have. And one of the fastest ways to get more lethality is to increase the C4 and network those assets. Right? Two key things. Next. In terms of agility, I'm talking now not only product, but process and ideas. And so how do we increase our agility? Whether it's in the idea space of actually putting on the deck an unmanned uh, UAV into Stingray, and then use next generation thought processes on those programs. That program, I think, has two KPBs total. Right? We've taken three years off of that program just by more smartly figuring out how to write the requirements, how to run the competition, how to deliver that. So, like SM6, the CNO and I just declared another. Uh, uh, urgent acquisition out of that program through our uh, Agile uh, acquisition bod right now. So we're looking at how do we use alternate acquisition processes to add lethality to existing capability. LRASM, urgent need, one of our first abbreviated acquisition programs set to deliver by the end of the year within 1% of cost. Uh, that'll be in the fleet starting at the end of this calendar year. And so again, you look at all these different things. Now C4. How do we tap into that? And my philosophy on this is cloud first, use products wherever we can, the way they were built, not the way we need to uh, try and uh, make unique military pieces. I've challenged the team uh, right now, I think our plan was five years to get all apps 
on the cloud, I think we should do that in three years or less. All right, so Vic and his team here are great, great lot of uh, aggressive goal. Now, how do we actually go make that happen, right? Because all of that will enable us to get agility and change the trajectory right now because on the existing timelines, with the existing cost, with the existing time to get things in the field, we are not going to deliver on the depth SecDefs uh, challenge and the SecDefs challenge in our national defense strategy. Next. And then we've got to change the cost of these systems. And again, when I say drive affordability, this is not meaning drive profit margins down or negotiate longer for fee. This is how do we work together to drive out cost of systems. If you look at what systems cost nowadays, it's unsustainable in the long term. Whether that's IT systems, whether that's capital equipment, whether that's uh, simple things. So across the board, how do we work together to drive out cost? How do we scrape the barnacles off the bureaucracy where I'm adding cost to you as a supplier? How do we scrape off the barnacles of processes so if you're in a fleet and you have an idea, we can get it serviced faster. How do you guys in industry scrape off the barnacles? Because you tend to be a reflection of us. So as we're streamlining, you guys are streamlining the same way. And then we actually value innovative approaches and innovative ideas in competitions and source selections. How do we leverage small business more? I think right now about 17% of Navy buys in small business. I think that's low. At SOCOM, we're in the 30%. Um, small business for us gives us great agility. It gives us uh, some great innovation. And then how do we put strategies together so that when we want to scale it up, we can link those up with some of the larger industry partners and then deliver at scale. Uh, in the IT world, this is, I think, particularly uh, uh, an opportunistic time to really look at that. And part of it on our side, or amongst all of us, is how do we create architectures where I don't have to redo the entire architecture every time I want a new application or a new capability? So if we could all agree on those kind of architectures and standards, then we can both drive affordability, increase agility, and then field lethality in the way we're going to have to do again if we are going to compete to win. Next chart. And then finally, to me, it's all about talent. It's always been all about talent. And I'm not just talking government talent here. I'm talking talent of our entire enterprise. And it's probably not a surprise to many that we've got some aging workforce issues. We've got some recruiting issues. We've got some retention issues. So how do we actually attract that next generation talent and free them up to operate at the speed they're used to operating now in a way they're used to operating now, not just train them on the way we did it 30 years ago, because that was a good idea 30 years ago. And to me, this is, this is our number one uh, challenge as we build a workforce to compete and win. How do we attract that talent and enable them to take us to the next generation? And that's something we're going to have to work together across the board. How do we leverage unique Manning models where we can have industry come work with government for a year or two and then bounce back. Or have government work in industry for a couple of years and understand, we think we know what incentivizes industry. Few of us understand that equation. Some of the best things I've learned in life was when I was nine months as a small IT contractor waiting to go on, on active duty. I learned more in that nine months about how to be a better government program manager than any of my kind of defense acquisition unit classes. So, Again, how do we leverage? How do we use 3D printing to enable innovation at the deck plate level or out at the fire base? At SOCOM, we've had 3D printers forward with fire teams for six years now with amazing results. So how do we, again, leverage that talent so that we can compete and win? Finally, next chart. Um, to me, it's, it's all a matter of urgency. To some degree, at least uh, in part of our force, we've had the luxury over the last 30 years of building exquisitely capable but very complex and timely weapon systems. And we've been fairly successful. We still have the best Navy and Marine Corps in the world, no doubt. But as you've heard in our national strategy, you probably heard from Secretary Shanahan, 
we are not at the pace that we will be that competitive and be at the place where we can win every war we fight and prevent the worst through strength as we need to if we don't change the trajectory. And to me, the key element of that is urgency. And if Secretary Spencer was here, that would be his, his key message to all of us. How do we act with a sense of urgency? How do we scrape off the barnacles, remove the sludge from the engine? How do we get at this so that, again, we can leverage all our combined talents and put the tools into the hands of the warfighter so that they can go the, do the missions that we're going to assign to them? That's where I'm coming from. That's what I've directed our teams to do. You're going to find that I'm decentralizing control of programs down to enable uh, decision making at lower level. So program managers have the authority to actually make decisions on their programs. You're going to see we're pressing out on agility and new business models. You're going to see that we're really focusing on talent and looking for unique talent models. And you'll see we're really looking at cost and figuring out where we, we are either driving costs into the system or asking for things that are costly but not lethal so we can change those trajectories and deliver for the force. That's where I'm coming from. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I'm happy to take some Q&As. Mr. Secretary, I'd just like to ask the first question, which is, in SOCOM, you had a very tight relationship between the operators who set requirements and the acquisition side with you. <clears throat> Of course, the scale in the Navy and the Marine Corps obviously much different. We've talked about this for years, about an iterative back and forth trade between requirement and acquisition. Can you talk about how you're going to bring that culture to the naval realm? Sure, great question. Uh, and I think that will come in, in, in several different forms. You know, a misnomer at SOCOM was we had unique authorities and unique waivers, and that was the way we could do things fast, and it absolutely wasn't that. But there was a lot of uh, decision-making pressed down to lower levels uh, and speed of decision-making, and then really closing the operator, the acquirer, and the technologist uh, more, more closely together. I think you're gonna see one of the, the key things we're working on is creating a bunch of different ways to acquire things. So rather than acquire everything in the, as we would acquire an aircraft carrier. You know, for IT, that acquisition model is completely different. For a piece of off-the-shelf gear, maybe for Joe Schrader in the Marine Corps, that model is different. So where, you know, I think where we're really moved to is a portfolio approach. Some things take a long time, and they should take a long time, because we're going to have them around for 40 or 50 years. But that doesn't mean every piece of gear on that ship needs to be built for 50 years. And so how do we then kind of get that speed up? And then the other piece is we focus a lot on the acquisition timeline. There's a pretty healthy funding timeline, pretty healthy requirements timeline, and then a pretty healthy fielding and training timeline. And so the other piece is as we drive that distance closer, you can start moving those more parallel. So the key to me of having an operator involved in the acquisition isn't as much that the thing we acquire will be better. It's that they can be training and building tactics and be ready to use that thing more quickly than if we build it in a vacuum and then just kind of drop it in. Uh, and then the CNO and the Commandant and I are working on this accelerated acquisition board of directors where we will look at something like we just did with the SM6 and we will kind of at the table do the requirements, set the parameters, give the acquisition team the go light and then launch. And then again, we'll squeeze that in for, for some things. So I think that's some of the ways we'll get after this. Sir. Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you for your comments. Kurt Warden, Open Power Solutions. You articulated in your comments uh, very well uh, your belief in innovation and, and specifically to drive innovation to drive out uh, or drive affordability. So, Typically, innovation involves change. Uh, change involves risk. So what actions are being taken to allow programs to take risk and make change? Because naval leadership clearly believes in innovation, but that needs to translate to program execution. Sure, great, great question. 
and, and part of this goes to my talent, right? So I think the number way, the easiest way I can do it is press decision making down lower in the organization. Because quite frankly, if you're a new program manager and it's your first program, I would rather have you have all the authority and if you're gonna misstep, misstep down at that lower level where you can learn from it, we can learn from it, and we can press on, then give you your first chance to do that you know, at a high level on a big program where we can't afford to misstep. Uh, the second piece is I, I like velocity, right? speed in the right direction. And so if we can achieve velocity and get our iteration speed up and our iteration cost down, then our failure tolerance goes much higher. So in an IT or a DevOps world, you, know, you don't do DevOps to succeed on every single algorithm by chain, you know, with 100% every time you do a drop, right? You get it by speed, by being able to try being, not putting a lot of money in it, try it, does the user like it? No, I wanna modify this. And so I think in many cases, we can use that approach, especially on lower acquisition category two, three, and four programs. There, there's a, a, you know, a challenge in the department over time was we decided what was good for a big, hairy ACAT one program was good for an ACAT four program. Uh, you're seeing me completely flip that model. So one, we're looking at decision authority, and then two, what is required for those lower programs where we have a little more risk tolerance, where if the return's high enough, we'll take uh, a lower percentage shot, uh, but do it in a way that you can control that risk and not put, it, you know, not put the whole uh, enterprise at, at risk, if that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Sir, Sidney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, pull, follow up on some of the questions already asked. I mean, you, you mentioned several times decentralizing authority appropriately mm -hmm. to the size of the program. Uh, two parts of the question. One is, what specific things are you thinking of decentralizing? What kinds of authorities uh, are you thinking of changing? And two, how do you apply all these principles to those mega programs, those 40-year ships, those $100 million aircraft, which are, of course, not the kind of things that SOCOM was procuring, where the SOCOM model may have to scale up if sure. uh, not change altogether? Sure. G great question, Sydney. So specifically, you know, a, a key example is milestone decision authority. So the decision to uh, allow a program to move to the next phase. Uh, so working closely with Secretary Lord, we have decentralized most of the large programs from OSD level to the Naval level. So all now but two ACAT-1 programs, uh, the authority rides in the service. I'm similarly looking at what authorities uh, and milestone decisions were, was I keeping at my level that perhaps we can put at the PEO level, specifically a acquisition category two and below programs, and then challenging the PEOs, what were they keeping at their level that they can push down? And so what does that get you? That gets you speed of decision making, right? That gets you agility, and that allows us to train and teach and develop a workforce at a much lower level. So again, they're learning as, as we go up. Obviously for those big mega programs, uh, you know, the other thing it allows me to do is if I can be more efficient in the smaller programs where there's less risk and we need speed, I can free up resources so that we're putting an appropriate amount of resources on the larger programs that are really, you know, world's most complex kinds of programs like aircraft carriers to make sure, you know, we've got all our attention focused on those. And so some of it's a balance of resources as well, uh, as well as acquisition documentation, as well as contracting methods. We haven't talked contracting methods here, but how do we do the same thing with contracting methods? If it takes me as long to write a contract for a $50,000 or $100,000 SIBR as it does for a $100 million development effort, that probably doesn't make sense because that's not where the risk is. So again, really looking at where do we have our assets deployed, where do we need speed and agility, and we've got some risk tolerance, and where do we need guaranteed performance, incredible performance? Because nothing ruins delivery to the fleet like not hitting schedules uh, and not being a dependable supplier because they're doing all their operational planning on that. So that's where we're looking at trading uh, resources and I think better applying our resources. Sir. Good morning, sir. Dave Mahelsik with Juniper Networks. So I've been watching Softworks uh, down at SOCOM for a couple of years and it's very interesting. Any chance we're gonna start to see that pop up in one or more naval areas in the future? 
Yeah, it's a great question. For those who aren't familiar, Softworks was uh, an issue we had down at SOCOM um, to enable uh, the, the challenge we we're having down there was um, for somebody to get an idea to somebody who could actually look in action, the idea was very inefficient, took a long time, and, and quite frankly, we weren't, we weren't getting the kinds of ideas in. So, yeah, one, we're already, you know, our, our folks are already starting to get integrated down there. How do we link up uh, and leverage that? And then two, you know, one of my assignments for the secretary is looking at innovation across the whole Department of the Navy and how do we better synchronize that and do we need a software like model? I mean, we've got lots of engagement strategies uh, in the Navy, cyber and small business. ONR does a lot of outreach. How do we get that all linked up? Uh, because it's not just finding the idea, it's having the acquisition programs and the financing and the requirements process rigged so that we can quickly take advantage of an idea that pops out, whether it's out of Softworks or something else like that. So we've got to get all that kind of piece synchronized up. Thanks. Sure. Good morning, uh, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for your service to the Navy and to our country. My name is Dave Crocker. I'm with Frontier Technologies. Specifically, as you're moving your decision-making processes down to the lower levels, I'm, you know, I, I have a teeny background, so I'm interested in a couple things. One is, how are you going to ensure that you are mining the gold that's on the surface right now? For example, you have a lot of cyber-related technologies that oftentimes don't get to see the light of day for mm -hmm. a whole bunch of reasons I know that you're aware of. So how are we going to elevate that so that we can get these technologies, agile technologies, automated testing technologies out to the, to the labs and to the test centers so that we can shorten that piece and perhaps even um, contribute to the integrated and interoperable testing part. Mm -hmm. The second part of that goes, we've got a lot of labs, we've got a lot of test centers who are operating in vacuums. They've got their own data centers, they have their own test events. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we're going to integrate those labs and those test centers so that we can start doing joint testing and more interoperable testing and get rid of the duplicity and increase the efficiency. Yeah, a great, great questions. I'll see if I can remember both of them. I would say at our core, when you have a very inefficient process, you don't have your assets deployed in the right way, and then decision makers are spending too much time just keeping the process cranking up, don't have enough time to think and look laterally. So part of my strategy is we, you know, sh you know or organizations are like ships. Uh, they gather barnacles over time. You don't feel each one attached into yourself to the ship. Just after five years, you're going about half as the speed you were, and the only way to get rid of it is a violent and deliberate action. And so part of what I like to do, and part of what we're, we're pushing towards is freeing up that administrative bureaucratic time that's soaking up a lot of our thinking time so that we can then use at the leadership level time to look laterally, share lessons learned, get that knowledge management across the board, and then really have thoughtful times to look at, hey, let's look at the entire ONR portfolio with all the PEOs and make those linkages so we understand, the PEOs understand what's potentially coming up so that they can plan for it, and those labs understand where the needs are and so that they can you know, tailor their programs to cut across. And then how do you look at that o &R portfolio so you have a, a wide bandwidth of a lot of things you're looking at quickly, and then you a little bit more deliberately commit where you're gonna put additional resources and where do you have to drive that transition agreement. And one of the things the secretaries, the service secretaries are now meeting regularly and one of their key you know, actions to us at, at our deck plate level is and then how do we get the labs integrated so we aren't all focused on one thing uh, and not focused on another. So there's some, I think, some thoughtful work on communities of practice. Uh, I think directed energy is a pretty good example of that where all the directed energy folks are getting together and looking across. There's probably opportunity in the IT, cyber, AI uh, realm for that. Um, I don't think we're, we're where we need to be on that. Again, part of, the, part of the great reason to get everybody together here is to do sandwich sharing. I was actually, uh, having run big conferences like this, I'm really impressed with the amount of government action that's out there on the floor and government talking about what they're doing, uh, not only to inform industry, but to inform each other uh, and see what somebody may already be doing that. So if Admiral Sharp sees it, he can take it to O&I, or if Admiral Tai sees it, she can adjust the program to see what's going on there. So I think, again, part of it is, is the value of conferences like this. Uh, sometimes they get a bad rap of everybody going to conference, but if we don't get together, we can never learn from each other. 
Sir. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm Kurt Hamill. I'm retired Navy, and I work for Esri. It's a commercial software company for geospatial information mm -hmm. systems. Um, so one of your comments uh, struck me, um, and I'm, I'm grateful for it, but it's uh, your approach to commercial software, and that is to encourage and perhaps even direct that commercial software be used as it's built and take advantage of the, the company's life cycle uh, mm -hmm. support that's done natively with the company's um, business model. Right. So my question to you, sir, is uh, how, do you, how do you send that kind of guidance down? Uh, how can you express that intent, and how can you get the Naval Research Lab, Navy Surface Warfare Centers, uh, the, the syscoms, how do you get them to understand the value of this commercial software product? Sure, model? sure, great question. It ties back a little bit to the Admiral's question here. Some of it is actually getting the end user closer to the actual software there is. So, it, you know, writing policy without having done something is really hard. Writing a requirement without knowing what's really out there is really hard. And then, and, and so part of the challenge is when we start writing requirements, we write everything in the world we would love. You know, part of my SOCOM experience is, you know, fill the 80% the soonest, and then you'll figure out the last 20% as you go. And, and over time, what you thought that last 20% tended not to be what you actually fielded in there. So, so again, I'm an intent-based guy. My intent to the force is shrink down iteration phases and spin faster. Uh, and I think our collective challenge, and I'm certainly one for the N2, N6s, that's all great. Then how do we have an IA infrastructure that can keep up with that pace so that we can certify those systems and we don't unknowingly create vulnerabilities or, or interoperability challenges because we're spinning in the commercial products that quickly. And so, so again, a great opportunity for industry to help us on what are open architecture standards we need, what are, you know, what are practices we need, and then how do we get to the point where, hey, every night I should be able to spin in a new app. But if it takes me four months to cyber certify that, I'll never keep up with the appetite. And so that's where, again, another area where we could really use some help I think across the government, because my goal again is wherever we can, we should use it as it's sold. Our purpose may be different, but the more we try and modify what already exists, the longer the timelines are, the longer the, the bigger the costs are, uh, and, and we're not gonna get there with that trajectory. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Secretary. My question is about uh, additional friction. Um, there's a perception, it may be wrong, that one of the reasons that SOCOM acquisition seemed so efficient was because some of those who add friction to the process, whether it's Congress, GAO, CBO, kind of gave SOCOM a pass in honor of the brave service of our soft forces, whereas they're very ready to crank out reports about how Navy acquisition has made this mistake and that mistake and this mistake and uh, that sort of friction really affects the acquisition forces' morale and also kind of soaks up the time of previous ASN RDAs in, in pushing back against it. I'd just like your comment about what you perceive, if you perceive that's a, a, a accurate perception or not. Yeah, I guess as a SOCOM guy, I didn't perceive I had you know, that much of a free reign or, or all the passes, um, but certainly there's a scale difference. I, but, but again, it's up to us to earn it, right? It's up to me to be your pulling guard to make holes to allow us to try, but it's up to us to earn it, right? And if we're not transparent, if we're not credible, if we aren't um, learning from our um, efforts, then, you know, again, my, my goal is I have no problem explaining what we're doing. And, and trying to uh, show that if we increase the tempo, even if that causes a couple of errors, that will, will vastly outweigh the perception that by slowing down, you're taking no risk. Because there is no, you know, there's a huge risk in not doing anything. And we don't necessarily have a good way of talking about that risk of not making a decision or risk of delaying decision or risk of keeping an old uh, piece of software on a network that's got a lot more inherent problems than maybe some performance problems on a new piece of software that's gonna be inherently more secure. So, yeah, but again, that's I think what, what you're paying me, I work for you guys, is to, is to get our collective credibility up. The other thing I would say is, you know, 
Congress notwithstanding, GAO notwithstanding, OSD notwithstanding, there's a lot of things we control within our own four walls. And so, you know, let's take those on first. Let's fix the things we've done to ourselves as an enterprise. Uh, and then proof's going to be in the pudding. I am a firm believer that will show better delivery and then that will help us gain credibility outside the, uh, outside the walls. Um, so my first focus are things we can control. You know, and speaking with Congress, they, are, they have given us more authorities than we have figured out how to use smartly. So our other collective goal is take advantage. I don't need any more authorities in the Department of Navy to move fast, to be agile, to, to move at the speed of technology. We've got to learn how to do that. We've got to create processes and a portfolio approach to life. But my limit right now is not a, a, a limit from Congress or something the GAO's holding up or whatnot. It's, we've got to figure this out. Um, and so that's our challenge. My challenge to you is to help give me ideas. Morning, Mr. Secretary. Brooke Morning. Nelson, I'm a retired Navy and uh, with Northrop Grumman. So relating to your remarks on speed, and also we had CNO as our uh, <clears throat> San Diego Military Council speaker the other day, and he was giving us a good look at the, the six uh, mm -hmm. focus areas. Did I get them which, right? Absolutely. All right. Uh, of which one of the important ones was we're not going to get all the ships we need right away, so allies and partners are important. Mm -hmm. So my question relates to the speed of that, and we're hearing that uh, that OSD and the Joint Staff are coming up with, uh, in terms of identifying specific technologies for allies and partners at specific prices and speeding up the delivery. Uh, my question is, I'd just like to get your general thoughts on that, because obviously we're interested in exporting and sharing the technology. What's your feeling on how fast that's going to happen and basically who the belly button is for the Navy. Yeah, great, great question. And, and it's one that Secretary Spencer is specifically focusing in on at the kind of strategic uh, level. So I think we all know in our hearts that our allies and partners are critical to success. Uh, Secretary uh, Mattis has recognized that in his comments. I think a couple things uh, where we've got opportunity. One is I think technology, specifically networking, assets across and, and bridging some of those interoperability gaps uh, is going to be easier as we go forward rather than harder. And it used to be you had to get everybody on the same radio at the same time with the same revision. And you know it's hard enough to do on our shipbuilding schedule. It's really hard to do on. But now technology is allowing some of these you know, kind of universal translators and, and translator boxes. So you don't necessarily all have to have the exact same radio at the exact same revision at the exact same time. So I think there's, and again, I'd be interested in your guys' idea of, uh, of the same problem. How do we use technology to help us bridge that? Uh, and then secondly, really looking hard at the foreign military sales process and where do we have opportunities to accelerate that? Now, fixing acquisition will be hard enough. Fixing FMS will be even harder um, because it's got a lot of different uh, incentives and, and challenges, but I think there's a, there is a, a growing realization we've got to fix that if we're going to move at speed. Uh, and, and we know how to do it. We've just got to, got to kind of get that will to do it. One way you know, I've proposed looking at that is rather than wait for a request for us to send a response to get an LOA back, why don't we just publish pricing? And why don't we proactively say, if you want this capability, the US is willing to offer to you for this price at this time in this configuration proactively so that countries can consider that proactively versus kind of this reactive, we wait for them to ask us to tell them what they might want, that we can accept it. I think there's, you know, especially in commodity-based kinds of things, you know, whether it's weapons or IT or some of that stuff, I think there's a lot of leverage, kind of getting back to my, you know, response to Citi, that we can't, you know, one size doesn't fit all, and if you do that, you don't put enough resources on the stuff that you got to spend a lot of time on, and you put too many resources on, on things that you don't. So I'm hoping we can come up with a, a much more fluid kind of commercial business process where we can, instead of waiting for a request, we can say, here's a pricing. Industry knows when they've got capacity in the lines. Uh, we know, you know what a reasonable price is, and kind of go the other direction. I think that would also help. Within the Navy, the Navy IPO has got kind of sole lead for that. 
Uh, and so uh, he's, he and his team are, 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 are looking at that very closely. Obviously working up through DSCA, uh, and I don't know if the depth sector have talked about it, but that's another area he's focusing on across the department. Great, thank you, that was very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Morning, Mr. Secretary. All right, welcome. there you go. There you well, welcome to San Diego, and uh, thank you for the refreshing remarks, plus the uh, emails that you send out with your notes. Those are very uh, timely. My name is Bob Kamensky, and I'm uh, with Spay War Headquarters. You've addressed the hardware and software acquisition. There's a large percentage of services mm -hmm. acquisition as well. What type of reforms and how do you integrate the services acquisition strategies into the changes that you intend? Yeah, a gr great question, and, and I should have hit on that because I, uh, I view it the same. I, I mean, I think the Navy has been doing a fairly good job of driving down costs in, in service contracting. Uh, a lot of that is really figuring out how to get with the requiring agent early in the process. Uh, you know, everybody struggles with LPTA, uh, and, and I'm certainly a fan of best value competitions everywhere to include in service contracts. But we as a government have to define what va what's valuable to us in those competitions. So I think, again, looking at different um, tools, and just like anything else, there are different contract models in, in that service kind of enterprise. But, but I'm, again, open to ideas from industry. Our spend on the service side is tremendous. There's tremendous opportunity. When I talk about driving affordability, services is certainly one of the places we need to really look hard at. Uh, and then again, looking at small business, uh, non-traditional suppliers, how do we make sure they're competitive and we're, and we're taking advantage of all their uh, ideas and approaches, not just kind of doing what we've done for the last couple of years in, in, uh, in our competitions. So great question. Yeah. Morning, Vivian Mashi with National Defense Magazine. Sure. Um, you talked about how the Navy is working more closely, trying to work more closely with Softworks, but as you're talking about different acquisition strategies and working more closely with small businesses, are there any plans to actually develop a NavWorks? Considering AFWorks was founded by the Air Force last year, mm -hmm. just wondering if there are any plans for that. If so, what are those plans? If not, why is it not? a why doesn't it make sense for the Navy? Thank you. Yeah, sure, great question. And again, you probably know from me, I'm, I'm a huge fan of figuring out how to reduce those barriers and creating places where, again, we can get, where I see most innovation coming is when we get diverse folks together who may not have been the ones looking at the problem forever to, to kind of get after it. I think the Navy has some advantages the other services don't have in their warfare centers. In our warfare center, our warfare centers are, are an excellent place where we've got academia and labs and, uh, and uh, kind of operators kind of mixing together. And so I think the challenge is um, let's look at what we have. And so kind of my approach is let me uh, work with Secretary Spencer and look at what we have across the Navy, figure out where we have those gaps, and then figure out how to close that seam. Uh, we, in fact, we just had a team at Softworks last week. So we're already building in all the relationships down there. Um, I just need to understand when I look across the whole board whether we have to create another unique thing or we can take advantage of uh, things we already have in the Department of the Navy. The Marine Corps you know, had for years uh, a, a really good model down there at Quantico where they've got ops and future concepts and acquisition tied well together. Uh, I know they've talked about you know maybe adding a little bit to that for non-traditional, but I would say the Marine Corps in, has been doing that for a long time and, and they're pretty well. Maybe he's got the warfare centers and some of the other pieces, just gotta make sure it makes sense uh, across the Department of the Navy. Great question. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Clark Orzali from Dassault Systems, retired Navy. I had the opportunity to speak to a group called the Rat Pack in the Air Force, yep. and they referenced the boot camp that you ran for uh, soft acquisition professionals, what are you gonna do to overhaul the training of our acquisition professionals to move at the speed of relevance? Yeah, great, great question. Again, it goes back to kind of my fourth pillar is, it's all about people and all about talent. How do we recruit, uh, select, develop, and retain kind of the top talent? Uh, for, for others in the audience, we had a program at SOCOM where the Air Force would nominate 
Uh, their top acquisition kind of junior force, we bring them to SOCOM for a couple months, teach them kind of the way we did business down there and sent them back. Uh, so we're looking at some of those same things in, uh, in the Department of Navy. That's part of, uh, we just had an acquisition summit, a workforce summit two weeks ago. That was part of my challenges of how do we, how do we really take a look at that and, and kind of cross fertilize uh, some of that expertise. Uh, and certainly I'll take lessons learned from my SOCOM time there. Thank you. Sir. Sir, Sean Heritage from the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental up in Silicon Valley. I loved your answer to the question about NavWorks. It's not necessarily about growing the innovation e ecosystem, it's about connecting it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that question was wonderful about how do we change the culture within the uh, acquisition professionals. What do you see as DIUX's role in the solution space? Yeah, great question. Again, an important unit there. Um, I think our biggest both challenge and opportunity is how do we synchronize? It's kind of like synchronizing new build, adding uh, capability to the fleet and working availability. How do we synchronize idea discovery, whether it's discovering a non-traditional partner who's doing something and we want to link in with, or if it's a cyber or something in the lab or something at Softworks, with a quick assessment, rapid prototyping, uh, check it out to make sure it, it makes sense uh, that it's going to be relevant and lethal, and then be able to field it at scale. And we, I would say in past, have suffered a little bit of, of, of working each one of those in a little bit of a cylinder. So I think our greatest challenge and opportunity is um, creating acquisition programs that have baskets, catchers, mitts, whatever you want to call them, so they can capture ideas and innovations as they occur and making sure they're linked to all those different entities, DOIUX or Softworks or whatever. And then on the backside, how do we not neglect uh, through life support? I was just down at one of the shipyards Tuesday and some really exciting opportunities to incorporate uh, AR and VR into shipbuilding and ship repair. And, and you know, guys are still carrying around you know, feats worth of drawings. And, you know, th that's, and it's really hard, especially in the talent game, as we bring on new talent in the yards, how do we, how do we take it? So, so I think the real challenge is, again, back to the question of, if I can get rid of administrative burden and inefficient processes that frees up time for us to think and look across and plan, then I think we can better take advantage of the great work that's going on at DOA Action and whatnot. And, and then the, the other piece I would just caution everybody, don't just think of prototyping as prototyping a thing. So I think a lot of what's going on out there are great prototyping processes. You know, I want to push O&R to prototype new contracting models for us because I can afford to take a little more risk there than perhaps I could on a large major capital ship or a large aircraft program. And so as we work together here, figuring out how to prototype processes and ideas and linkages is just as important as prototyping widgets. Any more? Secretary Bob Shea from AFCA. There's increased reliance on software and uh, software-based capabilities and uh, enablers, applications, networks, software-defined radios. Software comes from many different sources. Um, you're also operating in a joint environment. What are your thoughts on how do we assure the quality of the software, the pedigree of the software, so we're not introducing net, uh, vulnerabilities in the networks from all these various different groups, organizations, associations that may be tied into the network? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I think of that question not just in software, because most of our hardware is built on software-based machines. Uh, and from a variety of suppliers. So, so product assurance, I guess I would call it, and the larger thing, I think is critical and in, in, in something, I know Secretary Lord, she's been talking with the SAEs, that, that we really gotta get our arms around, both architecturally as well as from a business process standpoint, uh, kind of get our arms around that. I don't have all the answers to that one. That's one, again, where I look to groups like AFCA, uh, NDIA, these groups, I mean, you guys are, you, you have the same challenges on industry as I do in the DOD. I, you know, I think this is one where we've got to figure out how to learn from each other and create some standards of behavior. And, and again, I look forward to those ideas because that's a, 
that's going to be that's a national level challenge that's not just in the DOD sphere. Uh, so I, and and if we solve it uniquely, that won't necessarily solve it at an enterprise wide. So you know again, I look forward to all your ideas. Uh, anything anything you've got there because this is one we I, I would say we do not have all the answers for yet. All right, thank you very much for your time. Give you a book here. Sure. Mr. Secretary, we know your time is precious. We appreciate you sharing your firsthand thoughts with us today. And uh, from AFSIA International and the Naval Institute, I'd like to give you this Naval Institute Press book, The Leader's Bookshelf by James Stavridis and R. Manning Ansel with a AFSIA bookmark as a small token of our appreciation. And we want to wish you the best of success in your enterprise. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now move to a break in the exhibit hall. We invite you to visit.